Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is a privilege to talk to the August audience here. And what I'm going to share with you is um, the kind of opportunities which India is using uh, within the paradigm of sustainable development and climate change issues, and what are the remaining challenges they really need to address. Uh, it's interesting that India's uh, emission is in a better position in the sense that it's, despite being a very large country population-wise, has only 6.2% of the total emission share, and also the per capita emission is less than two metric ton um, of CO2. Uh, we need to understand that what are the factors which are affecting this trend of emission in India. I always say that there is a structural advantage for India in the sense that it is 60% service sector, and which is less energy intensive, per unit of its output produced. So this puts India in a historical advantage position. If you look into the emission trend over the years from 1990, I love this diagram to show because this shows that if we look into this, then activity growth in India is rising at a very faster rate, and which is uh, understandable for the population growth rate and its growth trajectory. But we can see that the energy, the emission, is really not increasing at the same rate. So they are getting decoupled gradually. And what is really driving this decoupling is the energy intensity improvement. And Although there is not much change in the fuel mix, which is so visible here in this scale, but there has been a little bit of structural change, but really what is driving is the energy intensity improvement. And if you look into the history of energy efficiency improvement in India, then you would see that it's the manufacturing sector which actually was the leader in uh, implementing this energy efficiency improvement. And this is another which I show many a times is that, so if you look into the decade of 70s manufacturing story, you will see that it was so coupled, the growth of the manufacturing sector was so closely coupled with the energy growth. Then from mid of 1990s, it really started the decoupling process. And then you can see here how this is getting divergent with the activity growth. So energy activity is growing at a very faster rate, but you need less and less of energy to produce the same manufacturing output. And that is due to the energy intensity improvement. And structurally also there is shift towards, if you look into this, then there is shift towards non-energy intensive industries. So this is really, I'm showing about the energy intensive industries and what they are doing. So this transformational change has really happened due to several uh, reasons. One is the process technologies in the uh, energy intensive industries have undergone a huge change. If you look into the cement industry, you can see that how the process technology has really changed completely to the dry processing. And then for uh, steel industry, I'm not showing for all, but for all the energy intensive industries, the process technology has undergone a huge transformation. And in that way, it has actually, uh, could it could catch up with the best available technology, which is the horizontal line for each of the industries in terms of the specific energy consumption. And you can see that how over time this is really catching up with the best available technology um, in different sectors. Paper is a different story because uh, this sector is very much dominated by the small paper units. So this uh, uh, this um, uh, catching up will take longer time. Uh, 
But this has not happened just uh, uh, on its own. So there was investment by the manufacturing sector, which they have made the private, uh, many of them were private manufacturing sector who have really invested. And if you look into these, then you can see that if we look into the levelized cost of carbon, and then if we want to know that, how much they have investment so far uh, for reduction in this carbon emission, how much has been spent, then they have spent from different ranges from less than 20 US dollar per ton of carbon to 100 US dollar per ton of carbon as well. So it's very interesting to see that the cement industry, which is really leading in catching up with the global technology, has actually invested the most and they have invested in the higher cost category also. So this is so, so much related to the investment made in different sectors on the different methods of energy efficiency improvement and how they have really reached the best available technology. So we tried to actually talk to the companies also. This was all from the, uh, I mean, the secondary data sources of the annual survey of industries, but then this is uh, uh, talking to the companies, we wanted to find out what is really driving this change. So we wanted to talk to them, and we talked to a very large number of companies across all different industries, and we came up with this, you know. The, they all felt that to keep themselves competitive in the market, they have adopted these measures. It's the influence of policy because um, Energy Conservation Act was uh, for a very long time in India in different forms. And then the price consideration of energy, price has been rising very fast. And then the consumer preference were also changing and the exportability. So all these things really led them to consider not only the energy saving, but in different ways. So they thought of recycling, and they really went into recycling of raw materials, and so how they can reduce the materials, how waste material can be used. So several steps actually have been taken um, by these uh, industries. And so we can see that it's just not only the energy conservation measure, but the renew penetration of the renewable energy technology with, the, with their um, power generation, because many of the industries have their captive power generation also. So they have integrated that with the renewable energy technology, and there has been energy savings measures of different kinds, and they have also changed their fuel policy, and they have changed how they can include, I mean, different kind of coal processing which are less emitting and then how they can replace the coal. So all these success stories are good, but then we wanted to know that how we can go beyond that. So is there any potential to go beyond that? So what we did was um, you know, we tried to take this India-specific data, very detailed data uh, at the four-digit, five-digit level industry, and then one of my PhD students worked with a GCAM modeling group in PNNL, and then we tried to see that what does it mean. So what we do usually is we usually do the uh, producer behavior modeling, econometric models, and we try to see that how um, different fuel inputs are responding to the price and the technology change. So we look into the technological progress parameter, that means uh, the autonomous energy efficiency parameter estimate, and then the elasticity estimates. And then we try to work with the GCAM model. Before I go to the GCAM model, what I wanted to say here is that this shows how the inter-input relation is changing over time. So I would say in 1993, when, uh, 1999, when I published our work in Energy Journal, then we could say that actually the, any carbon price or carbon tax will be reducing the productivity of the Indian industries because they are so much dependent on uh, uh, the energy complementarity with other inputs. But now we are finding that they are getting uh, in, in the substitute mode. That means technology is changing in such a way so that now if you have carbon price, then actually they will be substituting away from the carbon intensive fuels because they are ready for that through 
through their uh, technological improvement and their behavioral responses as well. So with that, what we tried to do was in 2008, when um, uh, India government came up with the National Action Plan on Climate Change, they uh, tried to look into this market response of the industries and wanted to build in a new policy to facilitate enhanced energy efficiency improvement uh, through creating a market mechanism like UETS, so they call it in India as perform, achieve, and trade. So with that PAT system, they created a carbon, uh, so they did not call it the carbon market, so they said that this is the energy efficiency improvement certificate market but you can convert it to one is to one into emission because it was targeted at fossil fuel uh, consumption reduction. So with that, energy efficiency improvement, so we wanted to know in the global model, if there is a global carbon price, what did it mean for the energy efficiency improvement of the Indian industries and where from it will come? So to get that insight, what we found was that if we just follow the uh, government policy of 2008 of energy efficiency improvement, then this is more, so this is without any policy intervention, the business as usual energy efficiency improvement, but with enhanced energy efficiency improvement with PAT scheme, we can get this much, but we can really pull it down further if there is a global carbon price. Now the question is, uh, where from this potential will come? So the answer was that the potential will actually come from the non-energy intensive industries, which are outside the policy domain right now, and actually government is thinking in terms of expanding its PAT scheme to the non-energy intensive industries. So we found that, so that thinking is in line with what we are also finding in this direction. So that is a good uh, policy match which we could see. But it would mean that there has to be massive electrification of the industrial processes. And in that also, the what we found was that all those things can be achieved. The, uh, enhanced um, efficiency and the global carbon price scenarios um, with uh, the uh, with the fuel mix change in the electricity sector. So now this is coal dominated, but it has to be all um, I mean zero carbon uh, uh, in that sense because this fossil fuel sector is also with. CCS, and this is nuclear share, and this is renewable, this is the model results. But if you look into, so what we did after that was we took a deeper dive into the power sector itself and wanted to see what is happening within the power sector. So what we could see is that yes, power sector installed capacity is going up, the demand is going up, which are just to give a picture of the sector. But uh, if you look into the by 2017 fuel mix, then you can see that what is happening is the dramatic increase in the renewable sector. So the model results showed that we, I mean, that model was set up in such a way so the nuclear share was coming up more. But then we can see that practically it's the renewable energy which is increasing its share dramatically. And that's how this is really um, trying to reduce the coal share. And uh, if you look into the capacity expansion, which is happening over past uh, but, uh, two, three years, and what is planned over next five years, then you can see that how uh, different sectors are going to add up to their installed capacity. And although we can see that still coal is not out of the um, uh, uh, table for the policymaker, but we have to think what can be done, but I'm just trying to show that what is there. So this is, uh, this is quite a bit of challenge, which needs to be looked into definitely. And so I'm not just not going with this, so what we have. So this is something which is uh, uh, promised in the, so if we build the uh, NDC, the National Determined um, Contribution, uh, which was promised by Indian government in Paris. So if we follow the NDC scenario and we try to see what will be the uh, installed capacity and generation by 2050, then we can see that still thermal generation will be 40%. So this is something which we really need to be taking care of. And then 
the, this is only the NDC scenario, right? So this is the renewables uh, will be, the installed capacity will be 47%, but then we can see that the renewable generation will be, contribution will be much less, or we all know the reason, right? So this is something which we really need to keep in mind that NDC scenario is really not making zero carbon power sector for India. So we have to look for further um, improvement and that's a challenge definitely which, which we should keep in mind. But what has led to all these changes? This is interesting to see that uh, the policy intervention, so market was working, but also the policy intervention has happened. And so the states where you see the share is more, you can see that they have adopted more than, so they have taken a systematic approach and then they have uh, changed multiple things to make the renewable energy penetration faster. The states with more systemic approach have achieved more and with the lesser ones have achieved less. So this is something which is important to note. And this is, some, this is something which is also important to note that not everything is success story. For India, energy efficiency was a real success story because they had a very good institutional structure, market mechanism in place, and history of um, industries responding to market for energy efficiency improvement was also there. So they were almost ready, and so they brought in a new structure to enhance that. But in case of biodiesel mission, it was a real failure. I always try to show why they have failed because the national biodiesel mission was really very badly articulated, very badly structured in the sense that while here the price incentive was very rightly constructed. Here, price incentive was really bad. It could not see the uncertainty in price. It could not integrate with the fossil fuel sector where it is going to compete with. So farmers really did not get the incentive. So what happened was that the 20% share which was envisaged was only less than 2%. So this has really not taken off. And um, uh, so this is something which I'm just not going. Yeah, so this is the same thing which I said, but but success story of the manufacturing sector was also because there were several supporting factors, the service, uh, the energy efficiency service sector itself has expanded a lot. And there has been different kind of incentive scheme, just not the price, just not the uh, path scheme and the market in energy certificate uh, trading. But then there were award scheme. So if you are best performer, so you are publicly awarded, and so all these things really led to uh, the uh, good performances in the manufacturing sector. So there is a lot to learn from what has happened. And this learning is actually getting integrated into the uh, new efficiency-led policies for the residential sector also. So that is also a very successful story, but which I'm not going to tell you now. And thank you very much. Are there any follow-up questions for Joshri? Yes, in the front here. Mikko Pyhälä from Finland. Uh, as you probably know, Finland was the first country to introduce carbon pricing in the world, 89. Uh, but uh, we have not been very good in keeping it up. And the European Union was very good in promoting a global carbon tax for the uh, Kyoto Protocol. But now the European Union does not want to talk even about global carbon tax because uh, taxing is an issue of national sovereignty. How can we get the world to accept global carbon tax, which is seen as an absolute necessity by many scientists? I, perhaps you are among them, and, and James Hansen, who is one of the leading climate scientists, is also of the same view. Thank you. To start with, this is my thinking, right? So it need not be a global carbon tax at the beginning, but what these studies are showing now is that in all the countries, the, the huge change in the technology penetration over past 20 years that has happened has made them ready to take a energy price hike. So let me see it that way, right? So from that point of view, each country can have their own system initially, 
Like if I talk about the perform achieve and trade, if you talk of the EU ETS, right? So within the EU, perform achieve and trade is within India. China also has similar systems. So many countries have similar system. So I would see that so for next five or six years, maybe it will go this way. So every country will be prepared for that. And then gradually you come up with a global carbon price because unless you have a global carbon price, you cannot manage the global common uh, bad or good, right? So from that point of view, you do need. But I would say that nationally we can continue but encourage national actions in that direction now. So there is a preparedness like CDM, right? So CDM was not meant for staying a longer life, but then that really prepared a, a, the, a, the different parties to see how they can uh, respond to a new market mechanism and where there is a carbon trading kind of thing really happens. I would say in India, that really changed the behavioral pattern and that created an enthusiasm for the good performer. And so they have led the whole process. So this perform, achieve, and trade is also led by them. So I think we need to be really looking into the process and trying to see how the new system can evolve. So one, we'll have one, two questions. We'll go together and then so right here. Okay, I know absolutely nothing about the energy sector and energy production in India, so I have two questions. One, uh, your NDC indicates that you are going to be uh, concentrating on nuclear power. Uh, can you say anything about the reprocessing of waste? Uh, how is that going to be handled in the future? And secondly, uh, is there any work going on in India on carbon capture and storage? Uh, okay. To start from the last, okay, sorry. We'll, we'll yeah. take a few questions, yeah. then, James. It was a really interesting story. I was very, um, very um, made very optimistic by your initial slides, which showed how much is already being done without a carbon tax to shift to reducing energy intensity. And it seemed to me then that you, you were essentially saying that this isn't going to be enough and that you need a carbon tax on top of that. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the pushback might be from manufacturing that is already doing so much that now has to then face an additional cost of carbon. And then what does it mean for energy tariffs and, and the, the many poor people who are still in India who presumably their demand for electricity is going up, the energy is going up more broadly. You know, what is the political economy around this policy and who's likely to lose the most from this, this policy? Thank you. We have room for one more question. My question sort of uh, links to James's in terms of the energy efficiency change that has been seen in India. Um, so you mentioned that the significant gains that have been made have been made in sectors where there are sort of larger industries. Um, so my question is more around in those sectors where most of the industries are smaller and maybe it's less easier for them to sort of switch their technologies, what support measures can we put in place to sort of help um, these industries move towards um, becoming more energy efficient. Thanks. Let me just uh, answer this question first, which is most common among all of them, is that energy efficiency measure has already happened so much, so what is more incentive? So number one, I would say that when the enhanced energy efficiency improvement program was introduced by Government of India on top of what was happening anyway with the industries was the articulation that it's going to support those industries who are performing better. So how you negotiate with the industry association, the big industries. So there was large uh, um, a number of or rounds of discussions. So they were brought in. So government did not do it. So Bureau of Energy Efficiency was the institution who was driving this. And they were talking to the industries quite a bit. And they wanted the leaders who were doing better to come up and say that, yes, they are going to do. So it initially the target was negotiated with them. So in a sense, I would say that it was kind of incentive for them begin at the beginning for the good performer. And so that really created a trading mechanism within the industries. So other low performer ones then tried to save on their cost. And so the and, and simultaneously there was energy 
uh, efficiency service companies, ESCOs, grew up in a very large number uh, because that was also a initiative associated with the PATH scheme. So I think these both of these together, so articulation with the industry, coming up with the ESCOs, and the price determination on the energy certificates really created the whole uh, business ambience for this to happen. Now, why they will take the higher um, you know, burden again? So, at least talking to the companies, we found that they really look for more advanced technology. They are always in lookout for more advanced technology. And these large industries are competing in the export market. So they want to be ahead of others. So that is a major incentive which they are thinking. So it is not about them taking this, but then whatever is happening, they're trying to get adjusted because they have historically done that. And that is putting them in an advantageous position and which they want to take it further. So industry associations are playing a very important role in India for this, for making meetings, for taking them to see what the new technologies are. So making all these things are really doing a great job. And for the small ones, there are like the small manufacturing forums, right? So they are now participating with these large industry associations also, and they're trying to see, and also they are collaborating with different universities, like in my past university, so we were collaborating with them with the technical support that how the small farms can get their new innovation so that in, maybe incremental, but at incremental step, how they can go forward. And there were like the energy award scheme and etc., which were the financial incentive from the government. So this is about the small, and, uh, but they are still lagging behind. And um, yeah, but for uh, the new ones, they are also thinking in terms of perform achieve and trade, expanding it. So from based on the success story, right? And this perform achieve and trade is now almost there for six, seven years. So it has shown. Okay. So just two things. So for the nuclear, now uh, the real expansion is in the renewable sector. So nuclear is also in agenda, but they are thinking in terms of, so there is huge research effort going on, so that how you can get the thorium-based um, generation with less waste and less waste handling problem. So these are new technologies which are under trial. So when I talk to the Department of Atomic Energy, I get this view, but it's more on the renewable sector the NDC is inclined. And for CCS, I would say that very little, very little, there is discussion, but very little progress. And for poor, when energy price is going up, what is happening for the poor? So basically what we need to see is that poor needs to have some kind of separate price. So that will, what it happens is that if we just look into the basic microeconomics, then it is the market opportunity will be reducing for them. So you can increase the market opportunity either by the say, vouchers, cash transfer, or different kind of thing, or you have the price subsidized. So right now the government is going through the cash transfer kind of thing so that you give market access through income generation. So more targeted programs because subsidy sometimes just doesn't go to the targeted groups. So this is a revision which is happening. So but I think that uh, uh, that is being, uh, that is tried out in different ways. And uh, but I think, I mean, India is now more or less with the flow that yes, energy price will be rising, coal price has gone up so much. If I show the graph, you will not see the end. So it is happening. <laughs>